You're listening to Got Tech, the podcast with your hosts, Eric Geis and Nick Johnson. Welcome back to Got Tech, the podcast. This is episode 127 called The 12 Days of Ed Tech. In this episode, we'll give some sneak peeks into our upcoming release of The 12 Days of Ed Tech for the year 2022. This is another episode you don't want to miss. Check it out. So we're getting into our, is this our last episode for the 2022 year? Yeah, uh, not quite. This will come out on the, actually it is, yeah, December 19th. So the next one will be January 2023. That is crazy. I can't believe that that's where we are right now. Where has this year gone? I was just looking, because this is the second time we have done this episode. Uh, Last December, uh, we did a similar one. Uh, called the 12 Days of Ed Tech, but that was for, if you remember, our uh, our 100th episode celebration is where this idea came from. So I can't believe that the 100th episode of Got Tech was a year ago already. That seems like it should just be a couple months ago. Uh, this is all insane. <laughs> I will tell you this, though. This is one of my favorite episodes that we do because it, it's a lot of work, but I feel like I grow a lot as an educator prepping for this show. For those of you who do not know, the 12 Days of Ed Tech is typically either... It's 12 things that we put push out. And really, there's no reason why we can't do this more often, but we just, uh, I don't know, life gets busy, I guess. But uh, we we do 12 pieces of content in 12 days in December. And it's pretty cool because some of them are blog posts, some of them are guides, some of them are videos. There's a lot of ed tech tools in there. Some of it's sharing best practices or tips and tricks. So a lot of really cool things come out of the 12 days of ed tech yeah it's like our little uh little way to celebrate uh well initially like i said it was to celebrate our you know this milestone for us getting to a hundred uh a hundred episodes but I, like you said we liked it and we're gonna we're gonna keep it up and i think make it part of uh one of the traditional things that we release uh each year at the end of the year so i'm excited because we do these independently i've got my six and you've got your six and we know a little bit about each other's choices here but i kind of uh, am excited to see what you've got put together for these things yeah i'm excited for yours as well yours typically go into a lot of the areas that i don't find myself very strong at so that that's a good uh you know it's a good opportunity for me to grow and learn around the holidays as well when I have a little bit of downtime. So super excited about that. Two basic updates. Happy holidays, Nick. I mean, we get to do uh, Christmas and then we go right into the new year. And I'm excited because uh, every year, minus the last two because of COVID, we have baby New Year's for New Year's Eve. And we have somewhere between 20 and 40 little rugrats typically you know running around our house which is it's kind of cool because it it's total chaos and i love total chaos but you're coming this year so that's cool yeah now that covid's done and now that i have a a baby my daughter's uh she'll be two and uh actually i guess if you're listening to this as it's been released my daughter's already two but uh we're coming to baby new year so i get to kind of see her right around your house with all those kids which is cool because she you know we have a like a babysitter come to the house every day she does not go to a daycare where she gets to see like a ton of other kids so i can't wait to kind of watch her interact with with that many other small humans it should be should be pretty fun yeah usually the ones that aren't used to kids they just sit there and take it all in because yeah. it's very overwhelming that's we'll, what I, that's what i'm expecting we'll see uh as we said in the last episode uh njecc conference uh is coming up march 7th i know it it's three months away, but it's going to come up quick. Right. Pete and C is coming up for all of you Pennsylvania educators. Uh, we're hoping to hear back from Pete and C to see if uh, we got selected to present there again. But that's pretty much it for the updates. And today's is just going to be a sneak peek of our 12 days of EdTech. So we're not going to get too specific on anything, but 
there's a lot of really cool resources for you guys all to check out as you, we head into 2023. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. All right, so let's get into segment two, which is the 12 days of ed tech. In the 12 days of ed tech, we come up with 12 different resources, blog posts, videos, whatever it may be, guides. I think we have a guide in there as well. And what we do is we share out one of these types of resources per day for 12 days. And uh, we have done this in the past. We did it last year, and uh, we're looking forward to doing it again this year. Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a balancing act in the episode itself because we want listeners to episode 127 to get something out of it, right? And walk walk away with some actual information and some ed tech tools. But we also want you guys to go check out these these posts. There's a lot of good stuff in there. So we're going to try and, and, and walk that uh, tightrope, if you will, and kind of tell you what each of the posts will be about. So each of the 12 days, you'll get essentially the title of it and a description and where it came from. And I guess if, uh, if we feel it's appropriate or if we're in the mood or if the feeling is right, we might tell you about one of these tools as well. Cause a lot of the times, like one of mine is three ed tech tools for better writing. I might uh, maybe feature one of those tools and then kind of push everyone to go check out that post when it comes out. Speaking of when these things come out, I believe we're going to push out most of this stuff via blog post and uh, Twitter, correct? Yeah, they'll, they'll be out. They'll be on our website. There'll be a post for everything. You could also find everything in the show notes for this episode. Uh, so you could just check them out here. They'll all go to the same spot. So we're very happy with this list. We feel like we picked some trendy things and some things that are, have been tried and true in regards to educational practice. But we're gonna we're gonna throw out a lot of new ed tech tools and, and a lot of updated or uh, brand new resources at you to see what we can do to help you. So and we're gonna help ourselves in the process as well as Nick said earlier. I did not look at Nick's stuff. I have no clue what he did. I just know that I'm gonna look at it because I'm sure I'm gonna learn from him as well. And some of the ideas for some of these posts came from other people such as the listeners we've gotten a couple questions which in the new year we always have our episode where we answer questions that we got from professional developments or from people uh, who twitter message us or facebook group our facebook page sometimes we get some questions on there so that's going to come up in a future episode but i know one of mine is triggered by uh, a question that someone asked me uh, in Twitter. So I'm very excited to share all these. I'm going to get us kicked off with uh, my first blog post. But within this blog post, I show you uh, several little, I would say that they're gifts, but they're not gifts because they're like 15 to 20 seconds. But I just give you a sneak peek into each one of these. So my first one is five Google Chrome productivity extensions for teachers to know in 2023. Uh, Time is essential for teachers and we don't get enough of it. It's the limiting factor of our practice. And uh, anything that we could do to be more productive with our time, both in and out of school, will afford us the opportunity to be more creative in other parts of our lives, whether it's professionally or personally. So I'm all about that, and you'll, you'll be able to tell that because my first two kind of fall within the same productivity category. But for this, I'll bring you five extensions that will definitely help you save time. And I know a couple of them are new. A couple of them went off of my productivity list for a little bit because they... Uh, I just didn't feel like they were bringing value, but they have since then updated, and now I'm very excited about those uh, certain uh, Chrome extensions again, so I'm going to share those with you. Yeah, there's nothing better than a good productivity extension to kind of help, and if you got five of them in just one post, I'm going to be checking that out for sure. 
my my first one so the the second one out of our 12 days is i think maybe my favorite one too it's um oddly enough it is centered around a an old tool uh known as powerpoint if you go back 10 years maybe even less than that we were all and i say we as largely speaking educators but you could extend that to really any working person who has to ever make a presentation about anything has probably done that in powerpoint and at least in the education world with this massive google shift that has taken place a lot of people have abandoned this tool for google slides with good reason there's tons of benefits to google slides that you cannot have with powerpoint but my idea here was that PowerPoint has not gone away. Our school, and I would guess most schools, are still buying subscriptions to Microsoft Office. So kind of buried there deep within the dark recesses of my laptop is Microsoft PowerPoint and Word and Excel and all these things. And these are still really powerful tools that a lot of you still probably have. And if you don't check it very often, you may not know that PowerPoint and those other tools as well They've continued to innovate and add stuff. And some of those things are really awesome and go far beyond what Google Slides can allow you to do. And I wanted to feature like a bunch of different things that PowerPoint can do that Google Slides cannot. I found one that was so cool, I figured I'd limit it to just that one. Um, I'm gonna tell everybody the name of it. It's called Cameo. And it is simply a feature within PowerPoint. It's relatively new. I think it might have came out last year in 2021 at some point. But uh, a very brief description of what it is, it's essentially a, a another option for a screencast recorder. When I know we've got tons of those now, right? So who needs another one? But with Cameo in PowerPoint, it's going to allow you to record those screencasts with a feature that is... Maybe I'll give a little bit more detail here. It's, it's, it's your webcam, so if you can imagine a recording of your face as you make this screencast, but the coolest part about it is that it gives these automatic frames or borders around that webcam recording. So if you can imagine like a little circle, right? Your face is within that circle. You can embed that circle within the PowerPoint slide so that as you're recording, your face is there, but it's not limited to like the bottom right or the bottom left, like a lot of these other screencast tools. And you can also give it a really kind of sleek look because of that frame of the circle. And as you click from slide to slide, you can change the size and position of that shape. So on slide one, your webcam is a circle in the bottom right, but on slide two, it's a square in the bottom left and you can move it around and it just gives you this really really unique look uh, to that screencast recording of whatever is in your powerpoint the other benefit is that you don't need any outside extensions so if you're going to be recording yourself narrating some powerpoint slides you can do that 100 percent within powerpoint it means you don't need to open up Screencastify, Screencast-O-Matic, Loom, anything else. It all happens right there in with the Cameo feature. It gives you that really awesome uh, embedded webcam look. And it's just something that you're not going not gonna to get with any of the other Screencast tools. So that pretty much describes what it is. If you do check out the 12 Days post, you'll kind of see me walk through how to do it. There's some other neat like transitional effects that you can use to take that to the next level from when you try this. But I strongly encourage everyone to just check out some of these Microsoft tools that are still there and still have some really great things to offer. I'm really glad that you went into a little bit more depth with this one because we often are so Google focused uh, right. that we miss some of these gems. And, and this one is awesome. As he said, you could change the shape, but you could change the size, you could change the position on the slide. And how many times have we had our face in front of content that was important to our screencast? Right. And to be able to move it as you transition the slide, it will transition from one spot to the next. So it's almost seamlessly getting out of the way, which is awesome. All right. So let's go into day three of the 12 days of EdTech. Uh, this is my second one. This one's also on productivity, but these are just Google Chrome productivity hacks to know in 2023 and there's five of these and some of them I'm very excited I use these every single day so they are 
probably not well they're definitely not new to me one is one was i found one uh and i'll share that one in a second because it's kind of counterproductive but productive in the same way and i'm gonna have to explain myself on that but (laughs) yeah so it is pretty cool um but all these productivity hacks will save you some time and as we say with every single episode that we do we often share multiple resources over a couple episodes that kind of overlap and the reason why we do that is you should be able to pick the functionality of a tool that you want and then you should have options so you could choose which one will best suit your needs so i just wanted to throw that out there because you know, we just brought up PowerPoint, and I always said that I'm a screencast-o-matic guy, and and Nick is a screencastify guy now, which is heartbreaking. But <laughs> uh, nothing against screencastify. I'm just like a tried and true uh, screencast-o-matic fan. But uh, what I'm saying is, is there there are options out there. If one tool doesn't, f- you know, fit your needs, don't scrap that functionality of ed tech altogether, try a different one. And we're hoping that we could provide some of those options. So our goal is for you to take one thing away from anything that we share during an episode. And we consider that a success for us. So mine's uh, five Google Chrome productivity hacks. And the one that I'm going to kind of tease here that I said is counterproductive. I think it's very important to take little five minute breaks throughout your day. I think that if you're just emerged, uh, I guess submerged, in work, work, work all day long, you slowly lose your productivity. You get a little slower or not as focused. So if you take a five minute break, give yourself, you know, just five minutes to reset. When you come back, you're more productive. So this is kind of just a fun little thing. You'll probably do it once. Maybe you'll show another colleague once. But uh, you can make your Google Chrome browser dance the cha-cha slide. (laughs) All right. So you go to any search bar and you type in cha-cha slide. And on the right, top right side, it's going to have a microphone. If you click on the microphone, when the cha-cha slide lyric says move to the left, your browser goes to the left. Move to the right, it goes to the right. When it says cha-cha slide now, it's going to do its version of the cha-cha slide. It makes me laugh. I've done it a couple times. I probably will never do it again after that. But it gave me my 30 seconds of, ah, oh, okay, this is mindless. And then I got back into it. And I was able to complete, I think, three videos in an hour, which is pretty ridiculous considering i just put my kids down to bed at 7 30 at night you know yeah i mean brain breaks are a thing for a reason that can be super helpful in those little funny uh i don't know if, what you call them hacks or tricks they can be cool it reminds me of something called the google barrel roll did you ever do that one no it's like i can't remember what it is but just you saying now made me think of it it's like if you go to a google search and type in barrel roll the whole Google page like flips around basically like a plane going into a barrel roll. Same kind of thing. Its purpose is only to get your head out of that space and give you a little break. But like you just explained, that can be super important. Um, I'm going to get into my, my next one, uh, our fourth on the list, which is three unique Canva templates. I was hesitant to talk about Canva more, but I don't know if you're noticing this, but it's probably the tool we push the most here within our school to other staff. You know, I, we're emailing about it constantly. We've done PDs on it. And as soon as I feel like everybody knows about it and it's old hat, I realize there's a bunch of people that still aren't using it and don't know that it's out there. Not only are they not using it and not knowing that they could get it for free for their whole district. Right. Canva keeps updating what it can do. I mean, talk about helping education kind of close that digital divide i mean this one tool alone this is my number one tool that i'll recommend to every school district one because it's free but two because it's so darn powerful i mean think about it let's do an exercise here i'm going to give you a functionality you tell me if it's possible in canva ready yep graphics yeah of course tables tables easy 
All right. What about uh, mind maps? Got a bunch of templates just for mind maps. Uh, presentations. Definitely made for presentations. Can we change the size of the presentation? <laughs> you can resize whatever you want. Digital worksheets. How about videos? Yes. Audio. Never ends. I mean, you, we could go on Cartoons. and on and on. Cartoons. Yeah, I mean, the list, literally, I hate to say it, but literally anything. And that's kind of what my this was about. So my three unique Canva templates is an exploration of some templates that are there that most people aren't checking out. And just one of them, I'll mention it because you kind of alluded to it just now, that is cartoons. They have a bunch of really awesome, like, comic strip style templates that are essentially blank digital comic strip worksheets with different figures. The students can copy paste them, different word bubbles so the kids can type in whatever text they want. And it's a, it's a built in lesson ready to go to ask your students to get in some groups and make a comic strip that illustrates their understanding of a tool. Uh, the real benefit as we keep seeing with Canva is that I used to have to go to some other unique website to have my students create a comic strip but now, as with all of the stuff you just listed out, we're just sending them to Canva. So I've got that featured as well as two other pretty cool templates for you guys to check out. Canva is absolutely amazing. I, I, I can't say enough about it. I love what they're doing there. Uh, if you want to bring Canva to your K-12 to school district, I reach out and we'll get you set up with uh, one of our contacts there that will help you be able to do that and be able to answer your questions more. All right, let's get into the fifth day of the 12 days of EdTech. And this is four EdTech tools for teachers that promote student creativity. Uh, in this, uh, it's a blog post, but I made a video that also will kind of give you a background taste of this. Uh, I, I talk about pictures, I talk about podcasting, I talk about graphics, I talk about a little bit of everything here that is going to allow you to uh, bring a little bit more creativity into the projects that your students are creating in their classroom. So I'm not going to spoil any of them there, but the podcasting one is really, really cool because it allows two people to record an audio from two different places just by using your email, as long as you have some type of a microphone and speaker, which can mean a cell phone, as simple as a cell phone, or a Chromebook, without any other thing, and it's high-definition audio. So that's my little teaser there. It is super cool. Uh, they have a freemium version. The freemium version, you, can, you have no time or space limits. Uh, you just get the basic editing tools. So... There's really nothing that you really need to purchase there. They, they can work with everything there. And then we can give you a couple other editing tools. Uh, if you go into our podcasting guide or some of our previous posts, you could see some of the editing tools for audio. And you could just app smash those two together and get the best of both worlds. All right. So I don't, I don't actually know what you're talking about right now, but I do know it sounds super interesting. So I can't wait for uh, 12 days of EdTech number five. That sounds awesome. And I'll, I guess then jump into number six and I'll do a, a similar thing. I'm not really going to talk about any one of these in particular, but I'll just say that it's going to be three EdTech tools for better writing and tease the fact that if you've ever been trying to do some writing and let's say you have a sentence or two that you can't get to sound the right way. Maybe you needed that brain break, but you didn't take it. So you're in a bit of a fog and you just can't get it to come out in the most professional, uh, concise way possible. I got a tool for that. One of the other tools featured is more geared towards the students and their writing. And it's going to give the kids a place to write collaboratively as an entire class and then end up with a, uh, essentially a, a book that is published and physical. That means printed words on a piece of paper that they can take home and share out. And if you if you listen to our show, then you know that we are super into that publication aspect of student work. And uh, I've got a, an ed tech writing tool that sort of brings all of that to life and makes it seamless for the teachers. So check out post six for these three ed tech tools for better writing. 
All right, day seven of the 12 days of ed tech. This one will shock you a little bit because I've been, you know, pro Jamboard for a long, long time. Uh, so, I mean, teaching AP Bio through uh, remote learning, I was Jamboard almost every single day. And I just liked the ease of use and everything. But there are things about Jamboard I didn't like. What kept getting me is the fact that you could only have 20 boards or 20 jam boards or whatever it is, 20 slides uh, per jam board. And I always had 24 kids. So, I mean, I always had to make two copies of a jam board, which was frustrating. There are some other things with uh, the limitations that you have as far as being able to annotate and, you know, things like that. But my next post, and it's a video as well, is... Uh, why Canva is my new Jamboard. And I think this one might be the coolest one that I've done this year. And the only reason why I'm saying that is is because a lot of people do not know that Canva is a collaborative space, a lot like Google now. They're getting more uh, innovative with their collaboration abilities with the students, and they're trying to make this process very, very easy. And with all the icons and the templates and everything that you have uh, for students to use, it really comes up with professional products that they're proud of without having the need for knowing a program extremely well. It's, it's a drag and drop. It's a click and replace. Those types of things. So check out my video on why Canva is my new Jamboard. Yeah, that's a that's a great one. If for no other reason than to get the word out there that you can edit simultaneously in a Canva, um, you know, a piece that you're producing in Canva, it's really really awesome. Yeah, and I know there's a lot of jammers out there. <laughs> I've heard a lot of names: jammers, jamheads, jambordians. If you aren't into the whole brevity thing, but if I go missing. It's probably because of that post. All right. So, no, I mean, no offense to the jammers, but uh, I think Canva's going to do everything you want it to, plus some more. The next uh, one we've got is one of mine. It's three ed tech tools for math and science teachers. I'm going to share just one of these tools uh, now in this episode, and it's a website called WolframAlpha.com. Um, it's tough to describe what Wolfram Alpha is. Um, you know, I would describe it as a kind of like a search engine, but more of a like a computational search engine in that the things you search are often questions that can be solved with with data. And this will make more sense when I give some examples. Um, but really, if you I mean, the best way to get it is to head to WolframAlpha.com. If you go there, there's a little search bar, but the, the main stuff you're going to want to check out is beneath that, where it's got four categories, math, science and tech, society and culture, and everyday life, where you can find things like, in the math category, one of the little buttons you can click is, let's just say, geometry. And within that geometry, there are different things that it can do, like compute properties of a plain figure. And as you do that, if you were a geometry student, you could click on that and type in different values of different shapes, uh, like inner radius, outer radius of a circle, and it's going to automatically compute and give you visuals of what that circle looks like in terms of its area and its um, the uh, perimeter of the circle and all this other mathematical information. And, um, you know, as a math teacher who's teaching geometry, you could have your kids exploring in here f for hours, really. And it could be very, very helpful. Under the science category, uh, they have a, a chemistry link, and it's going to allow you to uh, do things like finding elements meeting certain criteria, like the 10 densest elements. Um, and you can sort them by density or by phase or by discovering scientists. That's what I mean by it's all just data that it sorts and organizes and puts into tables and visuals for you. Under society and culture, you can click on food and nutrition, and it's got all kinds of statistics about nutritional information for different foods or comparing nutritional labels of a, you know, I'm looking at one now that's the Whopper versus the Baconator versus a Big Mac, and it kind of compares them side by side. In the everyday life category, there's one called hobbies, 
where it looks at um, you know video game versus board games in terms of popularity and um, here's one I haven't seen this before Mario Kart platform not even sure what this is showing but showing me here because I'm not super into the gaming world but I'm just listing these out to give you a sense of the types of stuff that is here and um, it's just this crazy wealth of information that you can go to to play around with with data information and visual representations of that data in a in a super easy way so if you're in the math science world you know, and as you saw, that even extends to society, culture, and everyday life, like health teachers. Um, you're going to want to check it out because there's some really, really cool things. That's WolframAlpha.com. And again, that's part of my, my post called Three Ed Tech Tools for Math and Science Teachers. All right. So let's get into the ninth day of Ed Tech. Uh, the ninth day, what we did is we took a look at our student podcasting guide, our teacher's guide for student podcasting. Uh, and every once in a while we update this and I looked at it and a lot of the tools and a lot of the suggestions we have, well, now that we've taught our class for two years, we have a lot of new techniques, new ed tech tools, more affordable ed tech tools that we could re recommend so we can get podcasting into classrooms in a often free way. Um, so what we did is we updated the teacher's guide to student podcasting. This is version 3.0. So you can expect a lot of new stuff in there. Uh, of course, some of the stuff like uh, the brief section on definitions and roles and things like that, uh, that's all the same. But we, we did add a lot of new stuff. It has a new clean look to it, which is pretty awesome. And we're excited to get this out there because... Uh, we can see the value of student podcasting in real life, uh, in, in real time. Uh, we now have, I think, 35 student podcasts on our hvspn.com. Uh, it's uh, the Hopewell Valley Student Publications Network. Uh, we have 35, 36 podcasts that are student-ran, student-published, and that you can find on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, all the major podcast players. What's cool about this is it allows them to track their own successes. I, we always tell them that if one person listens, and it doesn't matter if it's mom or grandma or dad or whoever it is, it's a success because they're not only pushing content out that is valuable, but what they are doing is believing in their cell themselves, and they're also using these soft skills that we want them to take in to the next uh, phase of their life, whether it's work or college or whatever it may be. They're getting everything that they need there, and they learn how to research. They learn how to speak. They learn how to publish themselves. They learn how to brand, and it's all while working with content within your classroom or working on their passion project. So super important. That's the teacher's guide to student podcasting version 3.0. For number 10, we've got one called two online timeline generators. I'm a big fan of, of timelines. I like the visual element and I think it's just a great way to help students synthesize their understanding of how time progresses. And there's some really awesome tools to make these things via the internet and some websites devoted to it. In this, in this post, I'm going to feature two of those. I'm not going to talk a lot about them now, but I'll just give the name of one of those two tools. It's called Time Graphics, and you can find it at a very simple URL. It's uh, just time.graphics. There's no .com or .org or anything. It's time.graphics. If you want to check it out, you can, you can head there and see it or wait for, for 12 Days of Ed Tech post number 10, where I'll give you sort of a rundown of what it can do how it works, uh, along with one other online timeline generator. I want to say this about timelines since we're talking about them. If you are, let's say, a math and science teacher and you kind of tune this out because you feel like you're not generally talking about a history or how time progresses, I would say you could do a timeline that does not have to reference time. And what I mean by that is I did, uh, you know, with my AP chemistry students, I had them make what is essentially a, a timeline using one of these tools, but instead of time progressing, like this is what happened in 1970, 
we used it as a way to map out a problem solving method. So where you would put the earliest segment of time, they just put in what's the first thing you would do to solve this question? And then as time progresses, they put in what's the second thing you would do to solve this question? So were they making a timeline? Not really, because time wasn't passing in the way you think about it for like a history class, but they were using the timeline generator and it was asking them to do something other than answer this question on a piece of paper that then just goes nowhere and sits in your, in your notebook. And it was a really helpful thing. So you might want to check out some timeline generators, even if you think you aren't necessarily teaching something related to history and time. I love when we find ways to use ed tech tools that have nothing to do with its main purpose. And, and that, that is a solid example there. All right. So we'll get in. I believe this is my last one. It's the 11th day of the 12 days of ed tech. Uh, this is going to be three activities that use narrative to capture the interest of students. I am huge. Like one of my favorite things about teaching is having students understand teaching through narrative, learning through narrative. So the, one of the ones that I'm going to share, and this is something that I kind of outlined. I have not actually completed this one yet. It's the only one I have not completed. <laughs> but I'm going to talk about how graphs can tell stories. All right. So I brought up graph a day before, um, but you could also use pictures. You can, they say a picture is worth a thousand words or something like that. All right. Well. Tell the students to put the thousand words to paper. That might be a little long, but just as a, we could go down each and every subject, I'm pretty sure, and we could fit either a picture or a graph into something valuable in that classroom. I'm just thinking, what if we had a picture of a battlefield and say it's the Civil War and we had the two sides and asked students to come up with... Um, you know, the North one here. So how do you think they won based on how they're positioned or something like that? And just have, see if they could tell the story. Uh, that would be valuable. Science, you could give a picture of a process and have them explain the steps or the different parts of that process. In English, you could just have a picture of the Renaissance and tell them to come up with you know, some type of uh, a mystery or a character development or a plot development based on that picture. Uh, in a music class, you can have a picture of sheet music and you could say, okay, what can you, what would be a logical melody to go with this, this uh, sheet music that would work? How would you know that? You know, just questions based off of that and put that into a narrative. Uh, world language, once again, you could have a picture and tell them, all right, you have the next 30 seconds to successfully spell as many things in this picture as possible and see who comes up with the most. Or you could place categories from that. So there are a lot of things that you can do uh, with pictures uh, and put them into a narrative form. And the narrative might just be the instructions. So I know that with the world language example, I said, here's a picture, have them write down as many that they could come up with in 10 seconds. And then tell them, use the, those words that you made in 10 seconds and put that into a narrative or something that rhymes or whatever it may be. But narrative is a huge part of learning and it's something that I'm pretty excited to share. Yeah, we, we talk about it from time to time, but we should probably give narrative more attention. I mean, it can be as simple as, you know, I, I keep going to stuff that I've done recently in my class, but I was trying to think of a more creative way to have my chem student solve a, a stoichiometry problem. And if you don't know stoichiometry, which chances are good, you don't, because who does besides chem students and chem teachers? But the idea is if you had a certain amount of chemical A, let's say 100 grams, you could use this problem solving method to figure out how much chemical B you need to react with chemical A. So if I have 100 grams of chemical A, I'm going to need 200 grams of chemical B. That's what stoichiometry lets you do. And it can be very dry because they're just writing out this, this calculation on a piece of paper. But with narrative, and what I ended up doing was I, I, I have a friend named Tim who is a project manager for a 
company that cleans up uh, environmental spills. So he gets a, a site that has some sort of chemical that's been spilled in the ground and he has to manage the cleanup of this chemical. All I did for the narrative was I, I got a picture of, of me and Tim. I put it up on the PowerPoint screen. And you should see how focused the students were just seeing me in my normal life with a friend. And then the tie-in was this story of, hey guys, here's me and my friend Tim. Tim does this real life job where he has to use really the skills that stoichiometry teaches to figure out how he's gonna clean up 2,000 tons of this fluoro chlorocarbon that got spilled in outside of Pittsburgh. And then using that narrative, it, tells, it really just ties into the kids solving a stoichiometry problem. But, it, I mean, the buy-in there is just so powerful. So I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. That's separate from what you were talking about with that post you're going to do for the 12 days. But it's just a really important thing to mention. And um, it doesn't necessarily lead in super smooth to this last one, our final on the 12 days. But I'm going to use it as a lead in anyway because our final post is going to be called Three YouTube Hacks for Teachers. YouTube, like any other Google tool, has all sorts of little tips and tricks, and that's where the term hacks comes in, just ways you can make it more user-friendly, and I've chosen three of those that could be particularly helpful to educators. Uh, one out of the three that I just learned about recently, I'm, I'm sure you know this because this is the type of thing that you seem to know and that I end up figuring out like three years later, but this one is... If you go to the URL for a YouTube video and you want to share that YouTube video with your students but not have any advertisements in it, uh, you know, because sometimes for very popular videos, of course, there's going to be ads and you might not want those ads to be seen depending on what they are, especially if you're teaching younger kids. Um, if you just go up to the URL and between the letter T and the letter U in tube, if you just type a dash or, or, or a hyphen technically, and then copy paste that URL with the hyphen into a new tab, it's gonna automatically pull up a video player that will show that YouTube video, but without any ads. I don't know how long this has been there. I feel like it's been around for a while, but I just learned about it and I've never heard anyone tell me about it. And that's the type of thing you're gonna get in this post of three YouTube hacks for teachers. You hear that sound? <laughs> that is the sound of minds being blown. <laughs> did you know that one? I did. Okay, I, damn, I knew you would. <laughs> I did. It was actually in episode three of okay. Got Tech the Podcast. <laughs> well, no, I don't that know. That explains if, it. I don't know which one it was in, but sure. uh, when way back when we were looking at the GIF um, generator right. based on a YouTube link, I, yeah. I do remember stumbling across that. There's also a couple other cool ones out there that you could do with the URL, but I'm not going to give them away just yet because I haven't seen that. A video or post that you're doing and I want to make sure that we we save some for there but if not I will definitely bring it up in a future episode nice That's going to wrap up this episode of Got Tech the Podcast. This is the last one for 2022. Welcome to 2023. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, in that new year, uh, maybe you should consider doing some New Year's resolutions. And maybe one of those should be, uh, you know, telling people about Got Tech the Podcast. Be the sharer of wisdom. All right. and, and one thing you could do is definitely point them to our website, gottech.com. You could point them to our uh, Apple, Spotify, anywhere where you can get podcasts to check out Got Tech the Podcast. Check out our YouTube channel and connect with us on Twitter at Guys Got Tech, at Nick Got Tech, or at We Got Tech. But until next time, happy 2023. Let's make this a good year. Thanks for listening to Got Tech, the podcast. Remember to subscribe to our show and follow us at We Got Tech on Twitter so you can stay up to date with the latest episode releases, blog posts, product reviews, and PD announcements. You can also follow Geist and I individually at Geist Got Tech and at Nick Got Tech on Twitter or on Instagram at Nick Got Tech. Finally, remember to check out our website, gottech.com, where we post all our episodes, articles, and resources available to you for free. Until next time.